السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today I will talk about some very important points that although most Muslims claim they know, yet they fall short of internalizing the magnitude of its meaning when applying it to their practical everyday life. When we live our life sincerely worshiping Allah, not influenced by this life's attractions, that's when miracles could really happen. To deny the possibility of miracles is to assume that there is no God that exists. Because miracles do happen when God bends the laws of nature to do what he wants to do. Allah has power over everything. Inna Allah ala kulli shay'in qadir. When he says, kun fayakun, be and it is. When we recognize that God is the one who created the laws of nature, then he is powerful enough to change them whenever he wants. In this talk, I will take you step by step from the most important statement Muslims declare when they pronounce their shahada, the testimony of faith, then bring your attention to the reason for being created. And at the end, I will tell you a real life experience of how a miracle could happen. If you pay attention to the point how the Shahada starts by saying La ilaha, it starts with the word La, negating, saying that there is no deity worth worshipping other than Allah. So with this La ilaha, no God except Allah, it emphasizes the unity of Allah and his oneness. Now we come to ask, what is the purpose of life? What does God say about that in the Quran? If you notice, it also starts with negating when it says, وما خلقت الجن والإنس إلا ليعبدون. I did not create the jinn and humans except to worship me. That is Surah Dariyat 51:56. So it is except to worship Allah. Again, starts with negating, emphasizing the one purpose, and that is to worship Allah alone. So there are two negations in our declarations of faith and our purpose in life. So we begin by negating any other purpose for which we were created except for this one purpose and that is Tawheed, to worship Allah, none other. Many will say, but it's taken for granted, every Muslim knows this, yet the reality is otherwise. And in this talk, I will demonstrate that it is not what they practice in real life. When Allah says that our purpose is worship, this worship can be defined as living our life in such a way that every second of our life, our intent, that is our niya, is in accordance and harmony with the intent of our creator. When we live our life so that not only externally, but internally, we have the same focus as what God's purpose is for us, and that is worship. Muslims would say we don't make shirk, we don't associate any other gods besides Allah. But the truth is that people's desires sweep their actions away from the cause for which they were created for. And the reasons for enabling them to deviate are many, due to the interwining of motives and actions. When people ignore their spiritual purpose and focus on the material world, that is subtle and hidden shirk because it is worshiping powers other than Allah. Allah brings our attention to what is more significant in life and warns us of what makes people turn away from Tawheed 
and deviate from the right path. We find many such verses in the Quran, such as in Surah Al-Kahf, verse 46, Allah says, Wealth and children are but adornment of the worldly life, but righteous deeds are the best in the sight of your Lord in reward and far better source of hope. المال والبنون زينة الحياة الدنيا والباقيات الصالحات خير عند ربك ثوابا وخير أملا الله منشز الباقيات الصالحات These are our righteous deeds in this life which will remain with us in the hereafter and the good deeds in this life go hand in hand with the level of our iman these are like the tasbih we do when we say Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illa Allah, wallahu akbar, wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al-ali al-azim. In another verse, in Surah Al-Imran, that is uh, chapter 3, verse 14, Allah says, Pleasant in the eyes of men is the love of things they desire women and sons stacked up sums of gold and silver fine branded horses cattle and tilled land that is the enjoyment of worldly life but in the nearness to allah is the best of the goals to return to من النساء والبنين والقناطير المقنطرة من الذهب والفضة والخيل المسومة والأنآم والحرث ذلك متاع الحياة الدنيا والله عنده حسن المآب And in Surah Al-Hadid, that is chapter 57, ayah 20, Allah says Note that the life of this world is but amusement, diversion adornment, boasting to one another, and competition in increase of wealth and children. Allah goes to the end of the verse and says, and what is the worldly life but the enjoyment of delusion? وَأَلَمُوا إِنَّمَا الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا لَعِبٌ وَلَهُونَ وَزِينَةٌ وَتَفَاخُرٌ بَيْنَكُمْ وَتَكَاثُرٌ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ وَمَا الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعُ الْغُرُورِ Allah emphasizes, he says, whereas the hereafter is better and more enduring and the world is transitory while the hereafter is everlasting. It is ironic that instead of being grateful to Allah for granting us all his favors, we get distracted by them. We must be God conscious in every moment to remind ourselves of our purpose whenever we make a decision and take action. As I said in the beginning, the focus should be on our purpose in life, not let ourselves be preoccupied by the demands of our worldly life, so much that we forget why we are here, what is the purpose of life. So this purpose has to be in front of our eyes every single day so we don't deviate, we don't do anything that is hypocritical. Wealth and children are the adornment of this despised life so we do not let our souls follow it. Some people take pride in their wealth and position. The adornment of the life of this world is vanity that passes and does not remain. In spiritual teachings, we are directed to be in a non-attachment to the physical world because the word attachment is widely used to describe our relationship with the world and is often talked about as being the root of human suffering. So do not tie your heart with money because it is going away. Nor with your partner, today they are with you and tomorrow with someone else. 
nor with high positions of power, because today it is yours and tomorrow it is with someone else's. That's why you see people who are attached to the physical world are not relaxed and never satisfied with their condition, no matter how rich and famous they get. On the other hand, you find spiritual people are at peace, happy, and content with their life. They have inner peace, which comes from being in a state of non-attachment. And that's the secret to be free of suffering. Basically, it is said that the more you are attached to the world of form, the more you will suffer. So in order to become free of suffering, you must relinquish attachment. Be in a non-attachment state. Aspects of non-attachment is inspiration, creativity, and love. When you love Allah, that's when you start to love all his creation. Non-attachment is the healthy one where you will be productive, get involved in your community, and initiate things to the improvement of life. But non-attachment does not mean detachment because detachment is characterized by withdrawal. The difference between the two terms is that detachment is static while non-attachment is dynamic. Because when you believe you become obedient to God's commands, you naturally want to do more good deeds. And that's why you find true believers are charitable in nature. They like helping others. They give to the poor. They share their wealth and their time by doing volunteer work. And they invite others to come to the right path and making da'wah. Allah says in the Quran, those who say Allah is our Lord and then remain steadfast, upon them descend angels. The angels will say, do not fear nor grieve and receive good tidings. That's Surat Fussilat 41.30. So those true believers were upright on the oneness of God. They did not confuse the oneness of God with the polyethism of others with him. They ended up obeying him in what he commanded and forbade. And they did not associate anything with him. They stood firm on the testimony that there is La ilaha illallah. And that is what Islam is all about, is to be content with what Allah has ordained for you. What is the natural state of a believer? A believer enjoys perpetual inner peace throughout life's ups and downs. In all circumstances, this inner peace is the pleasure of knowing Allah in their heart. That is the real joy that only true believers know the taste of it. No one can take that inner peace away from them which remains with them through life. True believers always remember Allah within themselves and they enjoy talking with other believers about Allah. There is no one that we should fear more than we fear our Creator. So, yes, it is normal that there are people stronger or more powerful than us and they can harm us, but our reliance lies with the one who is more powerful than any of his creation. And this reliance on the power of Allah should prevent us from fearing his creation, such as we commit the act of shirk. A situation where we find humans dominating and subjugating other humans it is one of the gravest tragedies in the history of humankind. And perhaps sometimes accepting such a situation and willingly submitting to other humans. 
I thought of inspiring you by telling you this real life story that happened to me during my third visit to Iraq to finish the making of the documentary film to help the Iraqi children after the Gulf War and the UN sanctions. We had to attend various conferences as awareness campaign. It was imposed on all expatriates who wanted to obtain a visa to go to Iraq. I was in such a situation being among people who belonged to a certain political party. They were living a life of fear, mostly not to offend their political party. Thus, they ended up blindly obeying all their commands, even if it went against their Islamic teachings. That's fearing other than Allah. It was imperative for me to bring them back to the right path and make them aware of the Creator in whose hands is really their destiny. One day, these officials came by bus to pick us up from our hotel where we were staying to another hotel where the conference was going to be held. And we got to talk about Allah. These men were very submissive to their political party. They were terrified because they believed that they could get killed or get imprisoned if they offended them in any way and went against their commands. Unfortunately, they completely forgot about the power of God. They only looked at the material world that they could see is what is happening during that time where the government was very controlling. And they were subjugated to slavery by reluctantly doing things that they didn't really want to do, but they got scared and they did it anyway. Now this bothered me a lot. I was filled with grief and moved to take action. It saddened me to see my own people who were the zenith of the spread of Islam at one time to come to such a degrading slavery of their inherent God-given freedom. There are many things that humans tend to worship or become enslaved to, ranging from one's own passions to the slavery of the state or the nation, which was the case here. Because Islam frees humans from all such false forms of worship by freeing their hearts from such overriding wants and desires. It frees the heart from such worship by attaching the heart to Allah alone and building a strong relationship between the individual and Allah. The individual then simply wants to please Allah. Whatever is pleasing to Allah, he is happy with, and whatever is displeasing to Allah, he is unhappy with. It was very important to me to shift their focus from being scared of the government to start trusting Allah and putting their trust in Allah, trying to remind them of their Islamic teachings about relying on Allah and have no fear from anything else. This has been my belief all through my life. I believe that if you are doing everything according to what Allah ordained you to do and you love Allah, then you don't fear anybody or anything else. You don't think that your life or your income or your destiny is in the hands of anyone else but Allah, not any source like government or a person. When I believed in my cause, I believed that the power of the Creator will walk me through it. Thus, I went on with courage, fearless. Because positions and authorities never intimidated me, I had no fear in life except to go against God's will. You do everything according to God and leave it. Leave it. Don't get scared. Believe that God will take care of you completely. Believe in God and put your trust in God. I joked with these uh, officials saying, are you going to write a lengthy report about us to your superiors? Then to show them that I fear only Allah, I said, but my connection is much higher than yours. 
Ironically, they understood it according to their own materialistic view. They thought I have connections with higher officials, and I let them be. Then I asked them, I said, to whom loyalty is due? To your party or to Allah? And I said, if you have faith in God's power, you will fear none other. And I went on talking about God. After a while, they started complaining about the weather and the horrible sandstorm we were having. The sandstorm was very heavy. We couldn't breathe. I could feel the sand um, grinding between my teeth. I asked, why don't you ask God for some rain? And they laughed. They laughed and they started mocking me by saying, rain now in April? Then they started to call on each other from the back of the bus to the front to ridicule my remark and make the whole bus laugh at me. At that moment, I made a heartfelt prayer and asked God, please God, show them a sign. With your mercy, let it rain. Then I turned to the guy who was ridiculing me and I said, I hope it will rain so much on you that you will get soaking wet. But he went on laughing even more. As I say this sentence now, I realize how sure I must have been to tell him that sentence. But by God's grace and power, the miracle did happen only minutes later. I saw little drops of rain falling on the windshield of the bus. It mesmerized me, and I was in total awe of God's power in answering our prayers. I began to praise Allah, delighted to be in that state of high spirit. While it made the officials even more arrogant in their insults and mockery, saying to me, you call this rain? Look at it, it's just few drops. But I had my eyes closed in a trance-like state, repeating the praises of Allah, saying, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah al-aliyya al-azim. Then the drops started increasing in their tick, by tick, and then tick, 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 tick. Then all of a sudden, it was a holy shower. It came down, pouring like a tropical rain. And at that exact moment of heavy rain, we arrived to our destination and the guy who challenged me was standing at the steps of the bus as he was the one assigned to lead the group into the hotel. By coincidence, maybe. The bus door opened and his colleagues jokingly pushed him out of the door into the rain. And then they asked the bus driver to immediately shut the door behind him, keeping him out in the rain. The man had no choice but to run to the entrance of the hotel for shelter. But because the stop was so far away from the entrance, he got soaking wet, just as I wished he would, subhanAllah. Meanwhile, the rest of us remained on the bus for a few more minutes until the rain stopped and no one got wet except him. Later, when I saw him in the lobby, he looked like a wet mouse. And he said to me, I believe, I believe. Please come on, pray for me. Let me not get sick from these wet clothes. And I said, well, I'm very glad that you believe. You can pray for yourself now. By making it rain exactly when I asked for it, it was Allah's mercy to guide those lost souls. I am so grateful to Allah to show them his powerful presence in answering our sincere prayers. Allah truly made a miracle by showing them proof of his existence. And it was a, a visible, undeniable, powerful sign because they knew that I was praying for it and Allah made it rain exactly when I asked for it. Allah opened this man's heart and with his mercy guided him to see the truth. Finally, by witnessing God's powerful presence, made him admit by saying, I believe, I believe. There is deeper and more profound 
metaphorical meaning of why there is so much mention of rain in the Quran. The analogy of rain in the Quran is just like rain can soften dead earth, the Quran can soften dead hearts. There is a sunnah of praying for rain that was practiced by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the early generations of Islam called Salat al-Istisqa. But at the time when I was praying for rain, I had no idea of the sunnah. I was just asking God and God answered my prayer in a miraculous way. And also God guided this guy to believe. And there is a hadith where it says by Allah that Allah guides a man through you is better for you than a herd of expensive red camels, which means guiding a person to Islam to be near Allah is better than all the wealth in the world. Is God really near? Can he hear you when you call on him? Do you believe in miracles? Because according to Albert Einstein, there are two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle. The other is as if everything is. Now you can tell us about your miracles.